Okay, you asked for it. This is the card that a lot of you guys sent me after the Fisker review where I mentioned that that was the worst car that I've ever reviewed, or at least the worst car experience I've ever had. And I didn't want to make this review about the Fisker again, because that's kind of a, a crazy comparison. Oh, which one is the worst car? Is this one actually worse? But a lot of you guys asked for this. This is the VinFast VF8. This is a, a car that's just now showing up in the US. You might not have ever heard of VinFast, but VinFast has this whole lineup. It's going to be like the VF5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. All of them SUVs, the 9 being the biggest three row. But this is basically a Model Y sized electric crossover. And it's. It has a shocking amount of similarities with the Fisker, I'll put it that way. But it's, it's different. I'll. I'll just walk you through it. So this is a very popular size to make a new vehicle, right? So I don't blame them for trying. Model Y is the most popular selling vehicle in the world, so why not make a competitor to that one? Uh, and this one, it has a lot of shades of, of good looks. I think the front end's a little bit complicated, but the headlights are here, the blinkers are here, it's got these DRLs, VinFast logo in the middle. And uh, I assume the VF stands for VinFast, so I think that makes this the VinFast, VinFast 8. But you know, you get around to the side and this is a pretty reasonable looking vehicle. It's getting, I get shades of Mach-E from this angle, from this front three quarter. You got your charging port up here. These uh, aero caps on the wheels, pretty normal looking. There is two trims of this, the Eco and the Plus. So this is the Plus, so it'll have a little more horsepower. But we get to the back and it's a totally normal looking hatchback. And I actually think some of these taillights again are bringing Mustang back, but that's the back of this. This, uh, this whole vehicle, this whole thing starts in the, I think the mid forties, 40 something thousand dollars. And then the plus is like 50,000 plus to me the the philosophy behind this vehicle was, yeah, we're going to have to make something cheap and they kind of almost did, but it brings back the age old smartphone question. Would you rather buy a brand new cheap piece of tech or a depreciated older flagship? And this one makes a good argument for the depreciated older flagship. But you know, let's start with some of the good stuff, right? So this is the key. It's black and white, so it matches the car, right? To me, it looks a little bit upside down, but whatever. You can unlock and you hit that back button and you can get into the back. This is a power opening and closing lift gate. And it's a pretty good amount of space. And when you want to cross over, you probably want it for utilities. So, you know, these back seats, they do sort of lean back a little bit if you want. And when they're not leaned back, you get more space, charging equipment, room for a full spare. Okay. So that's a good fundamental. You don't always see a lot of plastic in here. I'll get to the interior materials in a second, but Hey, power opening, power closing. It's a good start, but then there's a little bit of good stuff to the back seat too. So I'll jump in regular door handles. They don't like flush recess into the back of the car. So probably less likely to break. And then you get these sort of brown and black interior seats. So a little bit more visually interesting than some others. And then I jump in and I'm behind the 6'3 passenger position. And I actually do have some space, a little bit of legroom, not a lot of foot room under the seats, but I do like that there's this huge glass sunroof. This can move, this can open. This is a pretty good spot to be, at least for right here. Now, why is there this in the middle? Typically a middle seat in an EV is a good spot to be because you don't need this tunnel for like a transmission, but this one still has it for some reason. But then also, hey, look, a good thing, 90 watt USB-C and two more USB-A for charging stuff. Love seeing that. And then let's say uh, you don't have a center passenger, no cup holders until you pop them out of the front there, little hidden things. So that's cool to see. Nice. I don't suppose you spend a lot of time in the back seat of your own car, but if you have passengers, obviously they'll appreciate the bare fundamentals of this interior, at least getting that done, right? Good headroom because it's a nice shape. It doesn't slope back quite as much as something like a Model Y. But then, yeah, pretty quickly you start poking around and feeling a lot of money saving, a lot of cheapness, like this plastic all through the door, pretty cheap feeling. This, I mean, that's a normal switch, but plastic handle. And so I'm sitting on vegan leather seats, which is totally fine. There's lots of vegan leather materials, but it's just, it doesn't feel great. It's not poorly made. It's just not a great material, but let's just get to the front seat because there's a lot more, there's a lot more to talk about with the front seat. So here we go. Let's drive the VF8. Let's see what it looks like in the front seat. Again, 
Oh, this is a, actually a decently roomy. Why did it just flash the headlights? What was that? That was weird. Okay. Anyway, this is a very simple interior. Shades of Tesla, lots of money saving, except in one really interesting way, which I actually kind of like. So right in front of the driver, you've got this nice sized steering wheel with real buttons on it. And there's a little camera right here, which I'll talk about in a second, but there's no screen behind the steering wheel. Okay, regular stocks with shockingly little travel. It's kind of hard to explain that, but no screen back here, right? Very much looking like Model 3. You just have a screen over here with all your software. But then there's also an HUD. So I think when I see no screen in front of the wheel, I think, ah, of course, less screens, saving money, but an HUD. I don't know, maybe Tesla should be taking notes from the VinFast. So I like that there's an HUD. Then you look at the rest of the inside of this car and you know, it's got the plastic, it's got normal switches here, really simple layout. Physical volume knob is actually kind of nice. You can have your hazards on, window lock, your gears here, two cup holders, and a wireless charging pad that fits a giant ultra size phone with two USB ports there. One for battery, one for data. Cool. Real HVAC controls is another huge thing. A lot of these EVs that are copying Tesla are trying to do everything on the screen. And uh, because of how bad this software is, I'm happy that there are real HVAC controls. Nice little mirror up there. Sunriser is pretty big. And hey, just to give it credit on a couple more fundamentals, wireless Android Auto and Apple CarPlay and heated and ventilated front and rear seats. Look at this. Front seats, heat them up. Rear seats, cool them down. That goes for right and left, front and back. Not too many other complaints about this extremely simple front. Other than like, this vegan leather is not the best. It's, especially seeing this huge swath of it right in front of you, you kind of look at that a lot when you're driving. But that's where it starts to get um, a little bit, as Doug would probably say, quirky. Driving this car, living with this car, lots of quirks. So first of all, the key fob, walking up to the car with the key fob in your pocket, nothing happens. Same as the Fisker, this is, uh, it's kind of unresponsive. You have to hit the button to unlock the car. Once you get in, fine, you're in. I've noticed once when I got, a couple times I got in the car and it was making this weird sound from the air conditioning in the corner of the car for a couple of seconds. I'll play a clip. So yeah, not really sure what that's all about. But then you get in and again, all of your software, all of your interacting with the car is here. So there's no power button needed, which I love. All you do is put your foot on the brake and the first thing it's gonna do is beep at me an obnoxious number of times. Turn the car on. Nice. All the lights. And then it tells you to buckle up often. Great, okay, thank you. Uh, once you're in, this is what your software looks like. This is giving me shades of like Kindle Fire 2013. All right, the, the layout is actually fairly intuitive, but it's just the graphics and the way it looks, which are a little bit odd, a little cartoonish and colorful. So this is your home screen, which is literally apps over here, like shortcuts to quickly use apps, and then widgets. And you can literally hold them down and remove or add widgets or change wallpapers like an old Android tablet, uh, which again, it's intuitive, it works, it's just a, I don't know, it's a little cartoony, I guess. These are all of the preloaded apps. It literally looks like a Kindle Fire. It's got Asphalt 9 preloaded, Baja Big Air preloaded, Nancy Drew for some reason preloaded. Um, but these are all the apps that come with the car. So you have the EV, normal EV stuff. You have your normal driver aids, which are extremely annoying and go off all the time beeping while you're driving. I love turning them off because that's seriously the best thing you can do when driving this car. Um, and then you can pair up a phone and make calls and everything like that. It's all here. It's just, you can see what I'm talking about, right? Like it looks like an old Android tablet and when I'd rather have like a new tablet from four years ago than, I don't know. But okay, you can see up here now the HUD looks pretty good it'll show you your speed how many miles you have left all that is great but here's my here's my least favorite favorite thing about the software in this car number one the cameras are weirdly low frame rate i'm just going to drive and see if you can see on camera if i drive forward oh it's another thing the fisker that's another thing the fisker does it makes you buckle up before it takes the parking brake off so you can't put it in drive 
and take the parking brake off. Okay, sorry. Drive, low frame rate camera. I don't know if you can tell. It's, it's not great. Um, you can at least see things pretty well, especially the reverse camera. Just weirdly bad, like 1990s <laughs> bad, <laughs> but okay, fine. That's your camera. Then the other thing is go into drive modes here and there is almost no difference between normal and sport. Now, eco driving will get you your most range and this car is seeing like 200 to 230 miles on a full charge. It's indicating more right now, but that's a pretty optimistic uh, estimate. Normal and sport, they're uh, almost identical. I found that this car has a little bit of a delay in the inputs and I think it's intentional. So hear me out. When you're switching from a gas car to an electric car, the number one difference with the electric car is usually the instant torque. Okay, sorry. Sorry, sorry. So the instant torque of an electric car, which is usually what makes it fun. This car has a programmed in delay. I think it's programmed in. So if you stomp on the accelerator pedal in normal or in sport, it like lurches on and builds the power up. And I don't see the point in that. I mean, I get that you're trying to make people switching from a gas car feel more at home and more comfortable, but Part of the nice thing about an EV is that instant torque. I don't want it to have to build up. Um, it does that in, in both of those driving modes. Creep mode is supposed to be whether or not you go forward or backwards when you take your foot off the brake. I've found that in creep mode on or off, when I take my foot off the brake, I still roll backwards on hills. That is really weird. That's also true about the Fisker. And then regen braking again is a little bit uneven. So high regen braking, which is nice. That gives you the most efficient driving and the best regen. It's not totally one pedal because it'll slow down to like three or four miles an hour and then take a while to get to zero. I wish the pedal tuning was a little bit smoother and more intuitive in general. There's also a ton of float to the suspension. Somehow this weighs a thousand pounds more than a Model Y. The steering is very vague. There are all sorts of points where I feel like my input is not steering as much as I think it should, or sorry, my input is more than I think it should be to steer the amount that I am. Just not a fun car to drive dynamically in any way. I'll put it that way, which is fine. That might be totally cool with you. But in its competition, which is like Ionic 5, Model Y, Mustang Mach-E, EV6, way better driving dynamics. And that just kind of speaks to this being a new vehicle for this company. And honestly, I think that that's really the theme that summarizes it. You know, a lot of you guys are saying this is a worse car. This will be the worst car I ever test. I, I don't think it is. It's not as buggy. It's just, it's just laggy on its face and a little bit behind the times as far as what you expect from a modern EV, like that throttle input and chassis tuning and things like that. But if you ask me which I would take, I would take this. But I think a more important question is, would you actually spend $50,000 on this car when you could get an older Model S or you could get a three or four year old car that's much more refined or even today, honestly, you could get a Model Y for fifty, fifty-five thousand uh, dollars. And is there any reason to consider this one over those? Let me know. I kind of feel like Vinfast is at the, despite being a gigantic company, at, they're at the mercy of being new to EVs, and they're going to have to get better at this over time. But we shall see. We'll let it play out. I just wouldn't recommend this car for right now. Okay, I did it though. I lived with it. I reviewed it. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Get you guys in the next one. Peace.